Good afternoon. Welcome to the AGM of the Royal Institution of Charles Surveyor 2022. I'm Clement Slough, the president of RICS. Before we begin, I want to advise you that this meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being held both in person and remotely to enable all members to attend if they wish so. I would also like to report that we received over 700 registrations to attend the meeting today. As my first item of business, I would like to introduce you to our new chair of the RICS board, Martin Samworth, who has been appointed. I'm very pleased that he accepted this role, and we all very much look forward to working with him. I will introduce him in a quicker details at the end of the meeting. I would like to also introduce you to our interim CEO, Richard Collins, who will be presenting alongside me today. The RICS executive directors, non-executive chairs of the RICS governance bodies and interim senior independent governor are also available to answer any questions which fall within their remit. There will be one work to conduct during the course of today's AGM, which will be to reappoint the professional auditor for the audit of the financial statements for the year ending 31st, December 2022. When voting has opened on the resolution, the resolution text and voting choices will automatically be displayed on voting member screen only. For those attending in person, please follow the instruction which were sent to you and vote using your device when instructed to do so. You have the options of for, against, and abstain. To vote, simply select your voting direction from the options shown on the screen. A confirmatory message will appear to show your vote has been received. To change your vote, simply select another direction. If you wish to cancel your vote, please press cancel. Once voting has closed, your last choice will be submitted. You will still be able to view the webcast while the poll is still open. We will keep polling open on the resolution for a minute before I close the poll and then announce the results. Towards the end of the meeting, we have set aside under an hour to answer members' questions. Members attending in person, please raise your hand when questions are called for and you will be asked to speak into a microphone so that those attending remotely can hear your question clearly. Members attending remotely should send any questions through the message system and this will be related to myself and CEO. If you would like to ask a question, select the messaging icon. Type your message within the check box at the bottom of the messaging screen. Once you are happy with your message, click the send button. All questions will be checked to see if they require any moderation before sending to me. This is not to eliminate difficult questions. This is so we can avoid duplication, ensure question make sense and prevent any inappropriate comments being made. Please note that the name of the person providing the question will be visible to our ICS staff and will be read out with the question. Please be aware that while we will endeavor to answer all your questions, there will be insufficient time available to enter into discussion or debate about any issue. There may also be questions where we don't have the required information to hand and we'll need to respond to the question offline after the meeting. Also, if there's not sufficient time to answer all the questions, we will respond to individual members after the meeting. All questions and answers will be published on the AGM webpage, which will be accessible following the AGM. Our first item on the agenda 
is to approve the minutes of 2021 AGM, which have been made available on the RISS website. I would like to clarify that you are being asked whether the minutes are an actual reflection of last year's AGM. Can I ask if anyone has any concerns as to the accuracy of the draft minutes before they are approved? If so, please type this into the message system or raise your hand in the room. As there are no comments on these minutes, I will take this minutes as approved. Thank you. We will now move on to the next item. The second material item of business is to receive the annual report and financial statements for the year ending 31st July 2021, which contains the professional auditor's report. This report received an unqualified report from the professional auditors following the audit which took place. May I hand it to Richard, please? Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, these are the annual report and financial statements for the period ending 31st of July 2021. Uh, the report and the statements are available on the AGM page on the website. The thing most to note about this is that these are the reports and the financial statements for the financial year, which ended now some 16 months ago. Um, as you will, many of you will know, we actually covered and reported on that particular year at the last AGM in the terms of talking through the annual review, which had been published alongside that. And uh, Clement and myself and Nick McLean as the acting chair of Governing Council covered in detail the performance during that year. Later on in this presentation, I will talk about the change in our financial year and how that will enable us to be in a position to present the audited accounts and financial statements to you much more promptly in future as part of our drive towards greater transparency and accountability for the operation of the institution. Just very briefly, um, 2020 uh, was a year in which the pandemic uh, hit globally and the institution itself was impacted by that. Um, the priority was to take steps to uh, reorganise the way we did business so we could continue to do some key activities. Um, for example, moving the APC process online so that we could continue to qualify and bring members into the profession. I believe that was done very successfully. We also had to take steps to stabilise the finances of the organisation. We saw a very significant drop in non-member subscription income as we were unable to undertake face-to-face -face activities across the globe. Uh, some reorganisation was undertaken and measures were introduced to control costs more effectively during that period. Uh, as a result of those steps, um, we were able to return an operating surplus for the year of around £8 million. However, at the same time, the institution also took out a revolving credit facility uh, to provide a line of overdraft facilities should the institution require them uh, during the period of the pandemic. So that is uh, a summary of those statements. They are, as I say, all available online. Um, and uh, I believe that we have uh, reported probably more fully on the performance during that year, during last year's AGM. Clement. Thank you, Richard. I can confirm that the annual report and financial statements for the year end of 31st July 2021 have been received. We can now move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you, Clement. I'm going to talk on now to talk about the business year, the financial year from the 1st of August 2021 through to the 31st of July uh, 2022. We've published information about our performance during this year online 
Uh, we've published the annual review covering that period. Uh, that is available online, and if uh, any of you want to view it, you can uh, click on that QF code, and it will take you to the relevant page on the website. What I wanted to do to put the year into context to start with is to play for you a short video which uh, provides some of the headlines in terms of numbers of the institution's activities uh, during the course of that year. The video clip that you've just seen and the following slides that I'm about to show you amplify some of the information set out in the annual review which reports on our performance for the year to the end of July 2022. The institution has continued to work with members and stakeholders to support and develop members and the profession more widely, to amplify its voice and to develop opportunities for members and the organisations they work for. I've been continually impressed by the contributions that members have made throughout this last year in what has been a difficult year for the institution. We've continued to see a growth in member-led and member-focused events. Uh, we have continued to work um, across the sector and with important stakeholders for the adoption of standards. Um, we've seen a very promising initial uptake of the new International Building Operating Standard, which looks at the whole performance of buildings. Um, we have updated the Red Book to embed sustainability considerations into core valuation practice alongside whole life carbon assessment standard. And in those last three areas, it's right to emphasise the work of the Standards and Regulation Board of the regulatory aspect of this institution which, uh, as you will recall from the uh, short slideshow, is one of the aspects of membership which members hold to be of the greatest value. We've continued our work and seen an increased proportion 
of women amongst our new trainees. And we've published Lord Michael Bishard's report uh, and uh, implemented the outcomes of Alison Levitt's review. Alongside that work, we have taken steps led by the Member Engagement Experience and Value Working Group to rebuild engagement with members, to do more to improve their experience of working with the institution and to demonstrate the value of membership. That working group has been member-led, uh, chaired by Rory Murphy, who's a member in the UK, and I believe has made tangible progress in rebuilding the work of the institution in this area. There is much more for us to do, um, but it has been a start and I believe members have seen tangible benefits from its work. We've also continued our work to improve diversity uh, within the profession and to improve equity and to make the profession feel like a more inclusive environment for uh, the widest range of people who may want to join the professional work within the sector. Um, we will see much more in 2023 but I think one of the most important building steps has been uh, the MOU, which we've signed with other bodies in the sector, to agree a common framework for collecting information and reporting on this important issue. Um, again, as with the MEVE work, it's a step, it's progress in the right direction, but there is much more for us to do. I just wanted to talk, I think, a bit more fundamentally about what's been going on this year and what the focus has been. The core focus for our work with Governing Council and with members has been to transform the organisation to become the professional body that you as members have a right to expect and one which properly discharges its charter obligations to act for the public advantage. All of this work has been led by members of Governing Council, helped in no small measure by members and others on our governance bodies and supported, I must say, enthusiastically by staff at the institution. We've much more to do, and I'll speak later about our current and future work, particularly on the transformation programme, but I do believe we made a real start and achieved tangible progress. During 2021, uh, we published the Levitt Review in full, as recommended by Alison Levitt, and have implemented all of her recommendations. And that included putting in place new leadership for the institution last September. Lord Bichard has undertaken his independent review and in June that was published in full and Council accepted all of his recommendations. The review provides a clear path forward for the institution. We've significantly stabilised the finances of the organisation, moving from a position of deficits and cash flow supported by overdrafts to a position of delivering an operating surplus. We've discharged the uh, revolving credit facility, which was taken out in 2020, and removed the charge on this building. We have sought to simplify the organisation, focusing on our core mission uh, and collaborating with others for the benefit of members and for the public advantage, rather than seeking to deliver activities ourselves where we're not best placed to do so. We have sold our building, uh, building construction information service uh, valued at some £26.3 million, pounds, enabling the institution's reserves to be strengthened while retaining a substantial stake in the new entity with the aim of generating further value for the institution and its members at a later date. We work closely with the new BCIS organisation on areas of mutual benefit to members and the sector more widely. We've transferred responsibility for the School of Built Environment in India to Amity University in a way which secured the position of current students and academic staff and established a future way of collaborating with the university, which will, I believe, better support the growth of membership in India. As a consequence, we've removed an ongoing financial liability and created a new stream of income from the commercial arrangement with Amity. We've begun to tackle poor member service levels and address the deep flaws in our information systems which arose as a consequence of the new system implemented in 2021. For me, a low point of 2021 was the impact that system had on candidates, on assessors, and on the staff here who were seeking to support them. 
and that happened when the new system was implemented and we had to take ARC, which is the system which supported candidates and assessors offline. During 2022, we've created a new online system for candidates and assessors to use, which is now being implemented progressively to support the APC process from the first quarter of 2023. I need also to recognise the important role that Matrix has played this year under its chair, Theo Till, in reviving engagement with the institution's younger members. The organisation is a fantastic example of an enthusiastic, agile and member-led group which delivers impact out of all proportion to its size and resources. And RICS must and will do more to support their work in the coming year. Alongside this, we have, as I've said, taken forward the MEVE programme led by Rory Murphy to improve member engagement, experience and value. We've sought to both begin to remedy past problems and put the institution on a sound footing for the future. Um, at this point, I draw your attention to the financial summary slide. This slide is produced in the annual um, report which we have published. And what we've sought to do here is to increase transparency by showing you a time series of over a number of years. What you can see from this is that member subscription income has been pretty consistent through the period, but the commercial income of the institution has dropped very significantly from its high point in 2019. Partially, that's as a result of the pandemic. It's also a result of the positive steps we've taken through MEVE to make more of the services and products available to members as a core part of your annual membership subscription rather than charging separately for them. One of the big challenges for the institution as we move into next year is to revive and develop a new commercial strategy for the institution under the new commercial committee that was recommended by Michael Bishard. This financial summary shows the position at the end of July 2022, which would have been uh, the end of our financial year. Um, as you can see, uh, the net result for the institution is significantly increased by the income from the sale of BCIS. But underlying that, um, we've delivered a surplus of some £3.7 million in the year. What we've been seeking to do is to put the institution on a sound financial basis with strong reserves so that it is in a position to develop in the way that it needs to do in the coming period. And as a part of our work to improve transparency, to enable members to properly hold the institution to account, we have changed our financial year. So uh, we are now at the end of what will be a 17 month financial year, which will end at the end of December 2022. This enables us to do a number of things. Firstly, it aligns our financial year with our business year, with the membership year, and also with the presidential year. That will make it much easier for us to be able to set out for you uh, performance, financial performance, and enable you as members to properly scrutinise that and hold us to account. It will also enable us with um, improved processes around end of year audit to be in a position to come back to you, um, I would believe probably in May, May 2023, to report fully with fully audited financial statements and accounts to report on our performance in the year, to move away from the position where uh, those things had only been shared with you some 16 months after the end of the financial year. So, um, Clement, that's the review for 2021-2022. Thank you, Richard. The next item of business is a review of the corporate performance during the period August to December 2022, and an update on the implementation of the recommendations from Law Bishop, mm. which was adopted in full by the RICS Governing Council earlier this year. Richard, please. Thank you, Clement. As we have um, extended our financial year, we are uh, running within the organisation a uh, five-month period um, of objectives and performance management to ensure that the institution continues to move forward during this period. But absolutely the thing that's central to our work and our thinking is the delivery of the transformation of this institution at pace. 
and primarily the delivery of Lord Michael Bishard's review recommendations, which we published in June and which Clement has said Governing Council accepted in full. Um, we moved very rapidly after the publication of the review report to establish a proper governance framework um, to ensure that we manage change effectively. Members are absolutely at the heart of delivery. Um, governing Council is incredibly hands-on to ensure that this uh, transformation programme is delivered in the way uh, that members need it to be delivered. We've established five steering groups to take forward the major aspects of the programme. Each of those is chaired by a member and uh, those working groups involve members from council, from the other governance boards and members from outside the central governance of the institution. And all of that is tied together uh, by a business transformation board at executive level underneath. We are delivering uh, the transformation um, over an 18-month period in three phases. The first phase uh, running through until the end of December this year. This slide uh, sets out uh, a number of the key changes that we have either made or we'll be making into quarter one, quarter two and quarter three of next year. And you can see that we have planned out all of the key steps. Just a couple of things to draw attention to. At the uh, very end of this programme, you can see Q3 and Q4 2023 outstanding recommendations addressed. You will all be aware that one of the things that Lord Bishop recommended was that we put forward uh, changes to the institution's charter. The institution's charter is an incredibly precious document uh, it's a document that's actually very directly controlled by members. So we have work to do through the governance working group, um, which is chaired by Clement himself, um, to develop any changes that we need to make to the charter and bylaws to give effect to Lord Bichard's uh, recommendations. But one of the things about uh, seeking any change to the charter is first that it needs the approval of members. So part of that work will be consultation and a member vote. And secondly, it needs the approval of the Privy Council. So there is a, a programme of work to be done there, but member involvement and member consent to those changes sits at the heart of that process. And the other thing that I would just want to draw out on this roadmap is the issue of culture and values. Um, a lot went wrong with this institution um, that was identified by Alison Levitt in her report. Um, Part of that was structural, around the governance structure, and we're making changes in that respect. But the other thing that went wrong was really around the culture and values of the organisation. Um, there's a very significant work stream as part of this roadmap to put in place the right culture and values. But part of that is establishing very, very effective working relationships between the institution, its staff, the governance bodies and all of the members who contribute to our work and work with us. And um, again, that work is being led uh, by a work stream led by Anne Gray, who's the incoming president. But it's something that I feel very passionately about, involving members in the work we do and establishing really effective, respectful, open working relationships between staff and members. I think we've made a good start on that, but there's still more to do, isn't there, Clement? We have already um, delivered a number of the recommendations uh, from Lord Bichard's report. Um, I won't read through them all, but you can see um, that we are working our way through the 36 uh, recommendations. And that leads me on to the priorities for 2023. Uh, here you can see uh, phases two and three of the programme. Um, importantly, in that first step, transitioning to the new governance structure and uh, the governing council itself. Uh, Lord Bichard recommended a revised structure for governing council um, and governing council has approved uh, changes to the election process and approved the detailed arrangements for that new structure to come into place. And we will be holding elections to the new council commencing in the new year. Um, leading to a new council taking up office on the 1st of July 20, 
2023. I would urge all members uh, to consider standing for Governing Council. Um, it's the critical part of this organisation, having members involved at the top of the organisation um, who are committed to the work and committed to working with us to taking the institution forward. Um, and even if you don't feel that standing for Governing Council is right for you, please get involved in the election process. Please vote. Uh, please look at who's standing for council and make good decisions uh, to establish a really strong governing council to take us into the next phase. We will also be opening recruitment for two senior vice presidents, uh, one to take up office on the 1st of July, and then uh, a second senior vice president to take up office on the 1st of January 2024. Again, um, please consider uh, standing for those posts. So we have a lot to achieve uh, next year. Um, a lot to achieve if we are going to become a truly member-led organisation, uh, one that delivers high quality and value for money services, and one where members feel their experience and their professionalism is enhanced by membership of the institution. Uh, thank you, Clement. Thank you, Richard. Let's move on to the next item. The next item of business is to reappoint Grant Fountain, UK LLP, as the professional auditor for the audit of financial statement for the year ending 31st, December 2022. As noted in the annual review, Governing Council took the decision to amend the financial year to end on 31st December. I can confirm that the audit committee was satisfied with the performance of Grant Fountain for the period end 31st July 2022 and support their reappointment. The audit committee has expanded its remit following the bishop recommendations and has become the audit risk assurance and finance committee. This committee will consider the issue of audit provider in the new year in order to have come to a decision in time for the AGM in spring 2023 as to whether to retain Grant Fountain or move to a different auditor for the financial year ending 31st December 2023. Please can I ask if we have any questions from members on the reappointment of our professional auditor? If there's no questions, I would like to propose that Grand Fountain UK LLP are reappointed as the professional auditor until the conclusion of the next AGM. This poll is now open. Please cast your vote now. I will shortly close the poll, please vote ASAP. The poll is now closed. Could we have the results, please?
it's clear from the results we have the four uh, of this proposal. So I would like to confirm that the appointment of Grand Fountain UK LLP has been approved. The last item of the AGM business is to note the composition of Governing Council for 2022 to 23. The slide now showing gives the current composition of Governing Council. We will be holding elections in the first half of 2023, and a new composition of Governing Council, which is in line with Bishop's recommendation, will be in place by 1st July 2023. Thank you. I can confirm that the composition of Governing Council for 2022 to 23, until the election has taken place, has been noted by the meeting. I would like to thank members of Governing Council for their services in the 2021-22 session for all their work and insightful contribution. The work your elected council has undertaken over the past year has been significant. Let's move on to the next agenda item. We now move on to members' Q&A. I would like to invite any questions from our members. We will be answering as many questions as possible. However, due to the number of questions received, and to be fair to those in attendance today, we may not be able to answer all of them during the meeting. Answers to all questions will be made available on the website. For anyone attending in person, Please raise your hand to ask a question and speak into the microphone when called upon and state your name, so that those attending remotely can hear your question. For those attending remotely, please use the message system to write any questions you may have. The first piece of the question is coming from our member, William Nicol. Can you, exp can you explain the position in respect of current legislative proposals in the UK, which could or indeed would create an organization effectively controlled by any government or rather its civil service who retain no semblance of or respect for a public ethics? May I pass it to Richard to answer the question, please? Thank you, Clement, and thank you for the question. This refers to what is now Clause 189 of the Leveling Up Bill, which is currently before the UK Parliament. Uh, that clause would give the uh, power for the Secretary of State for Leveling Up to institute an independently led review into the institution's activities. <clears throat> and it would do so with very little framework or safeguard around it. We've made clear that we disagree with that provision. Uh, we think it's unnecessary and we believe it to be a dangerous precedent. We think it runs the risk of creating a chilling effect on the operation of what is an independent professional body. Uh, we have made, um, uh, we've made that clear to ministers, to civil servants, uh, former Chair of Governing Council has done that as well. I know that uh, individual members have spoken to MPs and to the Secretary of State about it. We've provided briefing in the Commons and the Lords, and we have approached others who we believe may uh, be willing to speak on our behalf. Um, we will continue our efforts to get that clause withdrawn, and we would very much welcome any suggestions or ideas from members as to how we might do that more effectively. The one thing I would add is that a provision like that only has a chilling effect on a professional body if the professional body is prepared to be chilled by it. 
I believe and I would hope that this institution would continue to do what it saw to be the right thing in the public advantage, regardless of the power of the Secretary of State to uh, institute a review, and we would be perfectly prepared to stand our ground in the face of such a review uh, should it come. So um, we will continue to oppose. I hope it will be withdrawn. Um, but the approach we should take should it come into place would be to continue to act as we do now uh, for what we and members see as the public advantage without fear or favour. Thank you, Richard. We have another pre-submitted question from Professor Graham Chase. Um, this question has been distilled to, into key points for brevity. However, a full copy of the question and our response will be available in the post-event summary. The question is that the makeup of the valuation review committee was fought comprising primary accountants and city institutions with only one recognized mainline valuer with no representation from regions of the UK or other world regions and has resulted in some inappropriate comments or recommendations to change RICS policy and the approach to the issues of valuation of investment, property, and value rotation globally. I therefore require comfort from RICS at the AGM that RICS will properly assess valuation policy based on full representation of its membership and not seek to dictate to RICS members, such as valuers, how to do their job outside of appropriate practice statement. Could I ask Dame Janet to take this question, please? Thank you, uh, Clement, and thank you very much uh, to Professor Chase for the number of questions that, as you said, we will answer in full uh, after this meeting. I want to start, first of all, by saying that I think the group that Professor Chase is referring to is the group that Peter Pereira Gray uh, brought around himself as an expert group of advisors as he was writing a report which was his personal report. What we are now doing following that report is, in fact, what we have done, in fact, is to set up a valuation implementation committee which has 10 members, seven of whom are uh, registered valuers with RICS. So I think, I think he's referring to a very initial expert working group that was actually working with Peter Pereira Gray and not the Valuation Implementation Committee, which was established immediately and is working now. It is the Valuation Implementation Committee that is actually going to set up the standing board that will work, sub-board, that will work to the Standards and Regulation Board as an assessment a committee. And that is the board that we will be recruiting shortly uh, for the chair. It's important to say as well that decisions, all the and part of the, uh, in respect to the latter part of the question, that no final decisions have been made at all. We are at the moment consulting. I think uh, the closing date is December the 14th on the rotation issue. There were a number of contentious issues in the valuation report, and rotation, I think, was, was one of the top. We are consulting on that right now. Um, the closing date is December the 14th, and we're prepared to extend that, if members would like, for another couple of weeks to make sure that people understand that this is the moment for the membership to actually say what it believes uh, should happen in relation to rotation. The second issue on methodology, and in particular the DC, uh, DCF, we will be consulting on in February. And then we will move on to the compliance officer, which was the third, I think, of the most contentious issues uh, in, in Peter's report. That probably won't take place until, possibly until the new uh, Valuation Assurance Committee is in, is, uh, has actually been established. We're moving as quickly as we can because the profession has asked us to move quite quickly on this matter. But we have got to consult on each of these areas because obviously they will affect the standards that we lay down, the way in which we will um, uh, register valuers in the future, firms and individuals. So no decisions have been formalized. They are out for consultation. So rest assured that we are following that absolutely uh, to the letter. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Janet. We have a question from uh, Walker, Anthony Walker. 
a Walker Anthony to be. I think it's Anthony Walker. Right? Consultation took place in the spring with the generals with 84% of those who respond, stating they are in favor of digital with an option to receive print copies. Will the outcome of this consultation be respected? And we see a return of hard copies generals to permit greater inclusivity on the way members consume information key to their role as surveyors. Richard, please. Thank you, Clement. Um, and I'd like to thank Anthony for the question because it gives me an opportunity to update on this issue. Um, the consultation that we ran in the spring, we had uh, 419 respondents, um, and out of those 419 respondents, some 322 um, uh, voted for an option to request print publications. Um, the decision on how best to structure information for members on their professional professional disciplines um, will sit in the new governance arrangement with the Knowledge and Practice Committee. So what we're doing as part of Lord Bichard's recommendations is we are setting up a new Knowledge and Practice Committee and that will work with and oversee the seven new professional group panels. A key part of that committee's uh, work will be to decide how best can the institution support its members with up-to-date information insight data about their individual areas of practice. At the moment, we have the MODIS journal and we have the four individual practice journals. Um, Knowledge and Practice Committee will be looking at the whole structure of that issue and deciding how best uh, to provide that information moving forward. But more than just provide the information, to really work with members to understand what information do members find helpful to get from the institution about issues around professional practice. So knowledge and practice will be looking at that. They will absolutely be taking account of the consultation on modus and journals. And I would hope they will be in a position rapidly to make decisions about how best to work with members to make sure members have access to the information they need to support them in their role. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there's a question from the floor. Could you please uh, s uh, give us your name and then speak to the microphone, please? Hi, it's uh, Phil Richards from Brecker Grossmith. It's interesting to hear that you're setting up a new knowledge and practice committee. As part of their work, would they consider um, widening access to iServe channels to members as part of the subscription? And the second question I'd like to raise is, the recent reviews undertaken into the organization highlighted the need to change and improve the culture and values. Um, I suppose I'd just like to ask, how, that, how, that, how is that going? And how is it going to be achieved? And what are, the, what are the key objectives behind the whole process? Thank you. Richard, please. Thanks, Clement. Um, on iServe, um, I think that is absolutely something that's being looked at by the uh, member experience, engagement and value working group. Um, already decisions were made last year to open up more uh, information and uh, assistance to members as part of the core subscription package. So I can undertake that I will make sure that the issue of access to iServe is included in Meave's forward agenda for this year and properly considered. So we will, we will do that. I can't uh, make any uh, indication straight off my bat about what we might do, but, but I'll make sure it's considered. On culture and values, um, what did Levitt tell us? Levitt told us there was a lack of transparency. Um, it told us, unfortunately, that there was uh, certainly the indication of a culture of uh, bullying um, and a lack of good behavior within the institution. Um, I hope people will feel that already we've made strides to address that. I actually think the most important stepping uh, point on that journey was Governing Council's decision to publish Alison Levitt's report in full and to act on it immediately. I think many other institutions would have ducked that and probably not published the report. So I think that was the first step, as I would call it, in the recovery. I think the organisation's changed a lot already. I hope you will feel 
that our approach to these events, to the information we're publishing, is demonstrating a greater level of transparency. Uh, and we will continue to do that. In terms of moving forward, um, Michael Bishard recommended quite intense work uh, on the culture and values of the organisation. And by the organisation, he means not just the staff within the organisation, but members as well and everyone we work with to foster and develop that open and transparent and collaborative way of working. Anne Gray, as the incoming president, has taken on the responsibility of leading the working group on that. And uh, I believe we will see additional changes rolling out in the coming year. But in many ways, we don't have to wait to be told by a working group how we need to behave with each other. We just need to be open and respectful and collaborative um, and trust each other and give people a voice within the institution. So I think that's something we've started and, you know, under Clement's leadership and the rest of the Governing Council's leadership. We'll just aim to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We have an online question from Frank Bruin. What is the RICS planning to do about the disastrous pauses dealing with APC in EMEA. Enquiries are going nowhere and candidates are lost in the system, resulting that FAs this year were only 10% compared to pre-COVID. May I ask Dame Janet to take the question, please? Thank you. Uh, as many members will know, the disastrous IT failure was the cause of us needing to take the ARC system down. And that is, I think, what is being referred to uh, in the question. Um, it has been a, an extraordinarily difficult time um, for both students and those who are trying to uh, complete the assessments for them. You will be, I hope, as delighted as I am to know that we are planning to go live next week with the new ARC system. We are user testing with live data as we speak and the system should begin to roll out next week, but it will be rolled out incrementally. There'll be no big bang so that we can actually control uh, if, if something goes wrong in, in the early stages. Um, it's been a long and difficult road for everybody involved, and I will um, provide a, a very much more detailed answer on the statistics um, to the gentleman who answered the question uh, as, as we complete. But uh, next week, we should see the start of the, of the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Before we move another online question, is there any question on the floor? Yes, please. Could you uh, give us your name and uh, speak into the microphone on yeah. your question of uh, feedback, my please? My name is Paul Savoir from Dunstan Surveyors. Um, I'm actually trained as a building surveyor, but I do a lot of valuation work. Um, there is an ongoing problem with EWS1 forms or the lack of them. Um, I was just reading on the train up here um, one of the, I don't know how many housing ministers it was, generic, um, he says EWS forms should not be a requirement on buildings below 18 metres. Well, I laugh at that because that was reduced to 11 metres. Um, but I've, on a certain estate um, in Uxbridge, uh, for, um, there, um, I've, I've did a valuation on a three-storey brick, modern brick block Yes, it had a couple of bays with some sort of metal cladding. I know not what, I was just doing the valuation, and some stacked balconies. That had an EWS1, and it managed to sell on, a, on the same estate by a different developer who seemed to refuse to think it was necessary to do any more. There was another property, there was a sale, someone wanted to buy four stories, admittedly, top floor, some cladding, yes, some balconies, not high risk, I don't think. Um, didn't couldn't get a mortgage from the mainstream lenders. They got a subprime lender. The valuer then downvalued it by about 10%, and I rubber stamped that. I was doing um, help to buy valuation. And what else can I do? Um, there is a problem. I, I, I don't think the, and I've read the more recent advice from the RSS, it doesn't solve the problem when you're actually having to do a de facto valuation where, when developers. Um, landlords and their managing agents are refusing, they're just hiding behind the RICS and government guidance and we're just stuck in a rut. I would, thank goodness I've got a freehold <laughs> detached house, that's all I can say. I would not want to, and I sympathise with my clients, but what can I do? I can't put a proper value on it. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think the R. I think if the RICS could be more instrumental, and I, 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 I think there is a problem with the CMO. You know, I think they're actually blighting a lot of low rise, low risk properties. Sorry about the complication, but there are some nuances there, which I don't think the RICS have addressed. I, I know you can't wave a magic wand, but I think we need to move this on because there, there are a lot of properties just not selling, or, or impossible to put proper valuation on because of this EWS1, and, and values are just hiding behind advice, and they're just blanking out, blanking out, saying we cannot, it's a nil valuation, which is not realistic, I don't think. Sorry, it's complicated. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. Um, could Dane Janet help to answer this question? Asking lay people to answer very complicated questions on valuations of buildings is, uh, is going at some. But having, having gone head to head with Robert Jenrick on this, I do have a little bit of, uh, of background in it. It is incredibly, as you say, it's complicated, it's difficult, it's still under review. Um, as you know, we've just um, uh, produced the cl new cladding guidance, which should complement um, the, the, the previous uh, guidance uh, in that area. Um, the, the EW1S shouldn't be used all the time. I think none of our guidance ever said that it had to be. Um, the government bringing down the 18 metres to 11 metres was a step in the right direction. And indeed, um, costing remediation into the valuation was a step in the right direction. But you're right, we have to keep at it. Um, and actually, it's one of the areas, if I, if I may claim it, it's one of the areas where, um, interestingly, um, the separation of our roles uh, within the organization of regulation and representation can really play a part together because while the regulator has got to look to what are the appropriate standards and guidance we give out, the, re the representative organization needs also to get in there with the lenders um, and put the pressure on the government uh, on, on, in the public interest on behalf of the, pre uh, on behalf of the profession. They, 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 their, names, their names are on it, you're absolutely right, and, uh, and, and holding them to what they've signed up to is, uh, is a very tricky business. But it is something for the whole organisation to do with two sides playing separate um, but cooperative parts. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Janet. Um, there's an online question from Paul Savio. Is the library functional and will we continue to subscribe to professional journals such as Estate Gazette, Building property news, etc. Richard, could you help, please? Thanks, Clement. Um, we never formally closed the library, although I do recognise that access was difficult during the pandemic. Um, the library is uh, fully open, operational. We've just recruited and employed a new librarian for the institution, Fiona Fogden, um, who will be looking after the physical library and the online information services. Um, the library, as I say, is open. We will have dedicated library support staff on site at the moment on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, um, but we'll keep that under review, and if there's demand, we'll, we'll bring people in more often. Um, we do continue to subscribe to Estates Gazette, Building, Property Week, and some other journals, um, and we'll publish an answer to this question um, in the um, full Q&A, and in that we'll include the uh, details of um, who to contact if you require access to other journals. So um, I think we're in a, a, a good place in terms of re-establishing the library. Thanks, Clement. Yes, we got a question at the floor. Please, let us have your name and then uh, raise your question. My name is Charlotte Mazir. I work for Amy Rao. I just wanted to, I noticed on the website you've uh, withdrawn some of the guidance notes. My question is, are you updating those notes and when should we expect to see the new ones published? Sorry, could I just check the, which, uh, I may have missed the specific guidance notes that you're referring to. So there is a number of guidance notes like with the competences usually on the website. So when we were looking for some of the guidance notes for the competencies, some of them were withdrawn and there's been rumours that some of them have been updated. Right. Do you want me to? Yes, please. So, I'm not sure which ones you would, if you want, if we could speak after the meeting, 
um, I'll happily uh, go through with you and work out which ones they were so that we can make sure that we give you an answer as to where to find them and uh, what we've done with them. So um, grab me after the meeting and we'll go through that together. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we have a question uh, from the online and then I'll come back to the floor. Um, the question is from Fraser Maldun. What is the position regarding the King's Kingsley Napoli report into the matters in the redacted Chapter 5 of the Level Report. Are any members to be subject to disciplinary proceeding if found appropriate in that report? Perhaps Richard, please. Yeah, thank you, Clement. Um, when Alison Levitt uh, produced her report, she produced a copy of her report for publication and Governing Council published that report in full. Uh, she also produced uh, what's become known as, as Chapter 5, which was other information which people had spoken to her about, which were outside of the terms of reference of her review, and therefore which she didn't feel appropriate to take further in the way that she had done uh, with the matters which were within the terms of reference. So, to enable Governing Council to move forward on the issues that she'd been commissioned to review, she provided a um, copy of the report to publish, but she also provided, at a high level, some further information about other things that had been said to her. Uh, Governing Council asked that uh, we commission Kingsley Napley, and in fact it was Kingsley Napley and Christopher Fuchs, who was Alison Levitt's junior, to provide all the information they had about those other issues. Um, and they did provide that information. That also was provided on a this is not for publication basis. We reviewed that further information um, and seeing what was in there, um, we are confident that the themes that were identified were all being addressed in the context of the wider Levitt um, recommendations. There was nothing in there which required a further specific investigation or action of any kind. We also made sure that Lord Bichard had access to Chapter 5 and to the further Kingsley Napley work, so he was aware of some of those underlying themes and issues that came up. In respect of disciplinary proceedings, um, I'm not in a position to comment on those. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me or anyone at the institution to do so. All regulators who undertake disciplinary activities do so uh, under the terms of a very specific set of rules and I have no doubt that um, should they feel appropriate at the correct time they will publish information about any disciplinary activities in respect of any professionals uh, coming out of the Alison Levitt report. Thank you Richard. Um, I think we've got a question from the floor. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Dan. Uh, Alan Dardlis, I'm the chair of the Property Research Trust. Um, I noted in the Bishard Review a, a couple of recommendations, one that the RICS should do more in terms of thought leadership and uh, secondly should uh, liaise uh, to a greater extent with academia. I'm just curious to know what uh, plans are afoot uh, to meet those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's, it's a timely one because absolutely Michael uh, Bishard did recommend that. Um, all of that work will be taken forward by the Knowledge and Practice Committee. Thought leadership, uh, research, relationships with researchers will sit under the Practice Committee. Um, and the reason I would emphasise that is not, uh, not from the perspective of it's not something for the executive to take forward, but it's really important under Michael Bishard's new recommendations and our new way of working that this work and these decisions are member-led. And so the Knowledge and Practice Committee will have a majority of members on it. It will consist also of the chairs of the professional group panels. And I would hope and believe that they will, uh, with a degree of enthusiasm, grab hold of Michael's um, proposals that we do more on thought leadership, on research, but also do more in a collaborative way, uh, working with trusts, with academics and with others. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, for us to show thought leadership, support the profession, but also demonstrate a collaborative approach to these things. Um, but that will all be taken forward by knowledge and practice, and I'm looking forward to them doing that.
Thank you, Richard. We have an online question from Joel Sherestenberg. What were the number of professionals in the previous year and what are the first results of the current renewals? Richard, could you enlighten, please? Thank you, Clement. In the year 2021-2022, we had 114,226 qualified professionals and 25,855 trainees. Um, I don't currently have uh, the current renewals numbers at the moment. Um, but we will ensure that we publish those as part of the AGM uh, Q&A uh, next week. The, the one thing I would say more generally is that um, what we have observed, it, certainly in the last renewal process, was that membership numbers held up very well. We had a high level of retention of members generally. Um, I believe we lose too many students before they qualify. The retention levels for students are not as high, and I would hope and would want to work to keep those higher. Um, the one thing we did observe in the last membership renewal process was that we had a higher request for concessions from members for a variety of reasons, but I suspect that was largely uh, down to the pandemic and changes in our professional members' working practices during the pandemic. So uh, that's the current position uh, but we will provide a more detailed answer in the Q&A when we publish it next week. Any question on the floor? If not, then we have another online question. If Sean renewed, why are all assessments still made online in Switzerland? It is unfortunately not the best way to facilitate networking between members. Um, perhaps Dame Janet, could answer this question, please. Um, thanks again. Um, another, another question. Um, uh, this one about assessments online. Uh, obviously, while we were going through the pandemic, that was the, uh, the way in which we managed to continue things, and that is continuing. What we are doing, however, is to consult with students and assessors to see what their view is about the way forward. And we have, uh, at the moment, uh, our uh, steering group halfway through their work on uh, entry routes and they will conduct this consultation. I think actually the consult consultation is actually underway as we speak um, to try to find out what the prevailing thought is. Should we stay online? Should we go back to face to face? And your guess is as good as mine as to what they will come up with. If there's no other question from the floor, then let's move on to another question online. It's from uh, Mary Ann Reynolds. How will the transformation be castigated down to each country? Members are often more closely linked to their country than the centre. Local member board are an important part of this. They have been stripped of all power in the past, and this needs to be re-established. What is planted? So Richard, would you like to answer or you would like to some of our colleagues to support you? Thank you, Clement. Um, actually, I'd like to invite Neil Shah, who's our Executive Director for Member Engagement and Development. Neil works very closely with the World Regional and Country Boards. And Neil, do you want to give a flavour of where we are? Absolutely, Richard. Thank you. Um, and Marianne, thank you for the question. Uh, as part of the B-Shard recommendations, uh, we are devolving a lot of that accountability to the World Regional Boards through the Member Services Committee. We're working on a consistent approach, and at that World Regional Board level, they'll help determine through their market plans where they're able to focus and how they're going to set up those local boards. So we're in the process of, of working with the Member Engagement, Experience, and Value Steering Group that's going to facilitate that. Uh, they will help determine the priorities, they will help determine how we allocate those local resources, and ultimately how we uh, promote the usefulness of the pr profession for the public advantage in those markets. So, absolutely. Thank you, Neil. Um, we have another question from Joe. Um, the communication line with our members is our weakest point in the current strategy. As chair of the Dutch Advisory Board and member of the EWRB, 
we are working as hard as possible to help to implement the new strategy and structure. However, due to the ineffective and insufficient manners to be able to reach out to us, our local members, we fear the current renewals. We, I think it's missing something. And we see a lot of members resigning their membership. And it feels that all efforts of staff and board will be useless if we don't change strategy right now. We have written a letter to us, GC, and the MIF group, and the senior management, but nothing has changed. This is a cry for help in order to save our beautiful organization. Thank you. Thanks, Clement. Let, let me take that, and thank you for the question, Joel. Um, our communications with members and our channels for communicating with members are not as good as they should be. I think there's been a very heavy over-reliance on email as the primary mechanism for communication. And over many, many years, um, I think that has become problematic, uh, partially because of the uh, large volume of probably uh, marketing type emails that were being sent to members. Many members, um, I think spam filters, uh, now send RICS emails uh, straight to junk rather than uh, being opened. Um, we will continue to try to improve uh, communication through email. Um, I think far more effective for us will be uh, communication through uh, social media channels, including the new My, My RICS community. And I would urge all of you uh, to uh, join uh, the My RICS community. It enables much more tailored and agile communication, and it is capable of being structured um, by specialist groups, but also by geography, by countries. The communication with our members on a geographic basis and doing that in a more effective way is absolutely critical for us. And I do absolutely accept Joel's point that it's not been good enough in the past. Um, but through the uh, My RSS community work, I think we have the ability to set up networks of members on a geographic basis and enable the country boards to communicate with them uh, more effectively and more directly. Uh, we have absolutely heard uh, from the Europe WRB and from the Dutch uh, Country Board. I know that's been discussed at Governing Council, so it has absolutely been considered at the highest level. And I have a very clear um, requirement from Governing Council um, for us to find better solutions for communicating with members quickly. So the letter did have an impact. This is an issue very high on Governing Council's agenda, on the agenda of the MEV Working Group, and we are working and we will improve that member communication because I agree it's absolutely critical for us. Thank you, Richard. Um, I would like to check whether there's any question from our members inside the room, please. <coughs> yes. Uh, I think, I think, let's speak to the microphone, please. Yeah, sorry. It depends if you go, I put several questions. I don't know how much you're editing questions on, online. Um, yeah, um, let me recollect my thoughts. I'm trying to think which one. Um, I think it's a general thing, but it has particular ramifications. Um, the lack of um, the RICS on, on the media, such as Radio 4, which I listen to quite a lot, on um, programmes like uh, you and yours and that sort of thing, on, on property matters, both building surveying, valuation. They seem to go to estate agents and various other pundits, but the RICS didn't, are not very represented. I mean, the thing I've particularly got in mind is um, I heard recently a um, programme talking about foam in installation foam in domestic roof spaces, which in principle is quite a good thing. I've been to CPD lectures on it. Um, it now seems it's another valuation problem. Uh, valuers are just condemning those pro properties and, and people are now having to spend a lot of money taking the foam out. Um, there was no RICS representative. I think it's a bit more nuanced there, that if you go into the detail, um, there is open cell 
foam and closed cell. Closed cell, I would absolutely say get rid of. It used to, you know, it, it's a yellow color polyurethane or something. The open cell one is used in Canada, which is generally colder than over here, and it seems to be okay. I think the documentation needs sorting out. Uh, I, can the RICS say something about this, and, and can we get someone like the BRE to, to test it? Because quite honestly, people are just paying to put foam in and then paying someone to take them out. I had one person who was originally selling this stuff, and then they what, rang up and said, no, no, we're taking it all out now. I think the RICS, from a valuation point it alone, should have, have a voice in this. But generally, I, I am concerned that the RICS is not represented in the, in the mass media. Um, yeah, sorry, there are two questions there. There's obviously the detail, which is a bit building surveying. But the general thing of not, not I'm not hearing the voice of a, a good um, spokesman for our, our profession on the radio, television, um, recently um, has demise. It, it's, it's diminished a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to hear this. I think we, we need to be better represented. This is a very good point. Yep. May I ask Richard to uh, take this one, yeah, please? No, thank you. Um, on, on the two issues, I know we have spoken on the issue of um, expanding phone, but we will get you an answer in the Q&A so that you can see and uh, reference where we've talked about. On the representation, I, I, I share with you the desire that on every um, news item regarding property, valuation, sustainability, we hear the voice of an RICS member. Um, I think we do get a fair degree of coverage, certainly around the surveys that we produce, the residential property survey, the commercial property survey, and it is quite regular for us to have, um, traditionally in the past, an RICS staff member there, but more recently we have tried very hard to have RICS members themselves speaking on our behalf. There's more for us to do, um, but we will continue to press for greater visibility for members and push members forward to speak on these key issues of the day. So I agree with the ambition and we will seek to get there. Thank you, Richard. Um, there's one comment from uh, Giles Ecker. I'm not too sure whether it's appropriate for me to, to read it out. I could read that one out, Clement. And, and he says, please ensure that warm thanks are passed on to Clement Lau for his excellent service as president during a year of considerable change, um, which is a sentiment that, that I can heartily endorse. I thank you. your Th embarrassment. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm, yeah. Um, um, we got an online question from David Duffy. National organization seems to be, seems to, seems to be being strive of funds. Why is that? Um, Thank, thank you, Clement. And um, from this, I take it that David is referring to um, actually the allocation of budgets and responsibility to the world regional and country boards to undertake activities. And, and actually, I'll invite Neil um, to answer this question because Neil has been working on it closely with the MEV Working Group. Thank you, David. I seem to get all the Switzerland questions yeah. today. Um, so the need to implement recommendations from the Bichard Report at PACE, balance with the need to invest in a better customer experience, uh, and ultimately being able to deliver more of the things that we want to do on the ground. I think those are critical points of reference that we are working through as a team collectively. Um, one of the things that we've tried to express to all the groups, and, and we've, we've done this across the globe, across the UK, is to really be transparent about our budget and some of the, the challenges that all institutions are facing. So the, the whole of our ICS effect on the ground is not just the local budget for engagement activities, which are critically important to the delivery of MEV, the local resources which are important, as well as the need for members to get together. But we're trying to ensure that people understand uh, that we are investing in a customer experience uh, that we are investing in knowledge and practice uh, that supports the profession, and importantly, as a professional body, investing in the standards and regulation uh, that truly differentiate what you do on the ground. So, you know, that, that's a whole of our ICS effect. While we're balancing the needs of continuing to improve uh, and being able to secure funds to invest locally, those are all the areas that we're continuing to invest in as we as we look at 2023. 
I hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, the gentleman at the far, far high left. Could you please uh, let us your name and then uh, follow with your questions, please. Uh, thank you, Clement. I'll stand up. Samer Bagian Fellow um, and Technical Director with Arcadis. Thank you for the, for the interactive session. Um, I've got a couple of questions and actually um, a commendation because the texts now coming in into the phone from the RICS on all sorts of stuff um, in terms of member communication I thought were interesting. You know, it's, it's when the first text came, I thought, well, that's an interesting way of communication. I, I, I like that, you know, so that's super helpful. The question is on the regional boards. Um, and I wonder where we are with that. And apologies if you touched upon this early on, um, because my understanding was some of them were running behind schedule, just because potentially either people not coming forward or something else going on in the background. I just wonder whether there's an update on those, on those regional boards, please. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, please. Uh, thanks for the question, Samar. Um, all of the regional boards are active. I think we do have a significant programme of recruitment to undertake in the coming year, both at the we uh, world regional board level and at a country board level. The, um, the uh, boards, for example, within the UK, I know that we need to refresh uh, some of them, but they are all active. Um, we are supporting them all in their activities and in their meetings. And in fact, in our new way of working, the role of the world regional boards and the regional and country boards that sit under them become even more important. Um, previously, um, those boards were categorised as advisory within the institution under the new governance structure that we're adopting post Michael Bishard's recommendations. They are absolutely ingrained into the governance of the uh, institution. The world regional boards become part of the formal governance structure. So it's important that they are all fully populated and I would continue to urge members uh, joining a local or regional board is a, is, is a great opportunity to contribute to the institution and actually to develop your own professional skills and networks as well. So I would urge all members to consider it because we will be uh, undertaking quite a lot of recruitment onto boards during the course of the coming year. Thank you, Richard. We got an online question from Annette Oak. Afternoon, with regards to members' fee, when will the review take place, especially in relation to current economic challenges? I understand the value add in being a member. Richard? Thank you for the question, Annette. Um, we've held member fees at the same level since 2020. So um, we are currently undertaking the um, subscription renewals for the year 2024, which I think will be uh, either the third or fourth year, I think. Uh, with the fees at this level. So um, we've done that in recognising that we've been going through a difficult period economically and many members will have been going through a difficult period economically, first with the pandemic and now with the economic downturn. We are undertaking a more thoroughgoing review of membership subscription fees during the course of 2023 with a view to amending them as we go into 2024. And please be assured that is not code for um, we're planning to increase them. What we want to do is look at the actual complexity of the fee structure at the moment. They are very, very complex. They're pitched at different levels in different parts of the world. Um, the concessions uh, structure we have, I believe, is not helpful for members and is relatively confusing. We're committed to ensuring that we have a fair and clear fee structure for members. Um, and we'll do that in 23 with a view to it coming into place in 2024. But of course, the fees are only one part of the value equation. Uh, and we will absolutely continue all the work that we've started through the MEVE Working Group to deliver better services for member and to deliver better value on that side of the equation. So there are two strands of the work, but we'll review the fees themselves in time for the 2024 renewal. Great. Um, we have an online question from Wayne Timberley. Having regard to the changes within the industry to recognize the importance of competence, and in particular, the need for those members who work within the building control profession 
to demonstrate their competence and who will need to be registered with the Building Safety Regulator by April 2024. What progress is RICS making with developing competence assessment and validation across the various surveying sectors? And more specifically, for members working within building control? Another tricky question for Dame Janet, please. Thank you. It, it a bit overlaps, and, and, and thank you for the question, because it does, it does help us, uh, I, I hope, at least link up some of the different parts of the work that goes on under Standards and Regulation Board, because this is actually related to an, a different survey that has actually been going on, the Entry and Assessment into the Professions Review, which some of you will have heard of, uh, feeding into the, uh, uh, into the SRB. Um, we had about 900 responses, I think, and actually obviously making sense of all of those in terms of routes to entry um, is going to be uh, a very interesting exercise. Not only routes to entry, but also um, post-qualification CPD, which again, we, will be, we are recruiting at the moment for our chair of the CPD uh, evaluation committee, which will look at essentially what we might call revalidation. Um, so there's quite a lot of work going on in this area. Um, we have got the results of the survey in, but we haven't done the analysis yet. So we will publish that analysis, obviously, when we get it. But uh, we also do um, consult with um, the, the um, relevant organisations, the Building Safety Regulator in particular, I think, as we look at the kinds of qualifications that people are going to be required for entry or indeed um, continuous CPD. So it is, it is something that's ongoing. Um, but the survey is done. It's not one of those that we'll tell you next week. Um, we might even tell you this week. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, we have a question from Iran Asmel. What is RICS doing when new students or candidates are trying to deceive or mislead? For example, if a, candidate, a new candidate, Mr. A, had Mr. B as counsellor and doing in doing review with Mr. B, the councillor, brought forward some of the issues which need clarification from the candidate, Mr. A. Mr. A, without providing the clarification, submitted for final assessment without Mr. B's approval. When clarifications were requested, Mr. A changed councillor. How are we tackle similar issues? I think ARC was very helpful when all submissions for new candidates were uploaded, reviewed, and approved through ARC. Previously, final assessment were scheduled only after submissions were approved in ARC by the counsellor. The process was documented online and had a track record of changes. Perhaps, Dame Janet, please. <coughs> Say this sounds very much to me like something that's leading to a complaint that will need full investigation and that we have a procedure for that as, as you all know but uh, trying to follow the complexity of it um, as far as I could understand it it is something that is going to lead to a complaint being made and an investigation to follow thank you um, we have another online question uh, Elsa Mat Matirha Kokmasaraslan. I'm sorry that if I pronounce your name incorrectly. But the question is that can network trips and meetings be arranged for RICS members? For example, we can meet in Istanbul next year. Richard. Thanks, Clement. Um, if I had a vote, I'd vote for meeting in Istanbul next year. Um, Look, we've got a quite busy uh, events calendar worldwide, including in-person events, and I know that Neil and the team are working to make sure all of those events are visible online to members. Um, and I would say, um, if you have any uh, suggestions for specific events, um, then please do get in touch, because we are looking to enrich the event schedule for next year. Um, meeting fellow members and that developing a network of peers is actually a critical part of being part of a professional body. So our work in the coming year to create more events and do more face-to-face, -face, I think, prevent, presents 
a really good opportunity for members to do more of that. And as I say, if there are suggestions for specific events or specific locations where we might hold them, uh, please get in touch with the member engagement team and we will look at them. Thank you. I think we have another question from Paul Savio. The RICS website is still not very user-friendly. For instance, I could not find anything about this AGM on it. When will this improve? Thank you, Clement. Um, we've been working hard on a new version of the website, um, and I am pleased to say that the new website will be launched um, either at the end of January or the beginning of February next year. Um, I had hoped that it would be uh, up and running before the end of this calendar year, um, but we need to do some more testing to make sure that when we do launch it, it's a really fantastic experience for members and it works really, really well. So I acknowledge that the existing website can at times be a bit clunky. It can be hard to find information, um, but we will be launching an updated and renewed website, certainly by the end of February next year, which will uh, deliver a much better experience for you and enable you to find the information you need more speedily. Thank you. Thank you. Could we check, is there any other questions from members from the floor? Oh, I think we have a question or point from our President Yila and Gray. Um, regarding the efforts for government to implement audits of organization, instead of asking for members' ideas on how to compare this provision, I suggest telling members now what they can do to help. For example, contact CEO directly with ideas, write letters to their PMs, write letters to editors of newspaper and industry generals. Oh, sorry, it's a, not a question, but a suggestion. Um, can, can I just take yes, that? Yeah. No, thank you, Anne, um, for the ideas. And actually, you are quite right. Um, there are things that, that members can do, um, particularly if you have good contacts with uh, frankly, members of the Conservative Party as the party in power in the UK. If you have contacts with your local MPs or other MPs that you know, please take the opportunity to speak to them about this issue. Uh, we have a briefing pack available uh, from within the institution um, and we'd be very happy to provide that and support you in any contact you want to make. Or if you feel it would be appropriate for you to write, we would be very happy to help you with material to include um, in that letter. Um, similarly, um, correspondence with newspapers, or if you have connections with other professional bodies um, who you feel would be prepared to support us in our endeavours to get this changed, um, please uh, get in touch. And, uh, and once again, thank you. Um, you are absolutely right. Thank you, and thank you, Richard. Uh, we have another question from Yves Sean Renaud. Why is there currently no country manager for Switzerland to support the advisory board? Yeah, Should shall I, shall I deal with that? Yes. Um, we don't have uh, country managers in every country within which our professionals operate. Um, we uh, have uh, professional members operating, I would expect, probably in something like 100 countries around the world. Um, and we are simply not an organisation of the size where we can provide a country manager for every country. However, uh, Switzerland, like all other countries within Europe, is covered within the structure and supported from within Europe, and we will continue to do that. We keep uh, those arrangements under continuous review, and should membership in particular countries grow to a size where uh, we could justify um, employing an individual just for that country, we, we will absolutely do so. But we will continue to support members in Switzerland from within our infrastructure within Europe. Thank you. Um, any questions from the floor? Um, <coughs> I got one. Just get prepared, I have another one, and then if there's any question, please raise your hand afterwards. Um, this from uh, Martin Kirk. The architects have a protected title why are professional surveyors not protected by law? And should the RICS be promoting legal protection for our title? 
the general public are totally confused by the fact that everyone who wants, who wants to can call themselves a surveyor. Th thank you, Clement. What is protected is, is the chartered surveyor uh, title, but you're absolutely right. Simply the term surveyor itself is, is not protected. I think it's highly unlikely that the government would introduce legislation to give statutory protection to the title of surveyor. Um, that is very limited. It's limited almost by an accident of history. Um, and if this government and if governments in this country over a number of years are going any way, it would be to remove statutory protection of titles rather than increase them. What we need to do collectively, that is the institution staff and members, to do more and be more effective in explaining to the public what it is that surveyors do and why it's so important that they use a chartered surveyor with all of the regulation and standards and protections that go with that rather than someone who isn't a chartered surveyor but simply calls himself a surveyor. And that's the challenge we have and, and it's one that we will try to do and do more effectively on your behalf. Thank you. Uh, any question or the last question from the floor before we close the uh, Q&A session? Thank you for all your questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all the questions and response will be published on the AGM page of the website afterwards. I would now like to more formally introduce you to Martin Samworth, the new chair of the RICS board. Martin joined CBLE as a graduate in 1983 and worked there continuously until he retired in 2020, with his last role being group president and chair, APEC and EMEA. Since 2021, he has previously operated as CEO and senior advisor to ROE 5Q, a pop tech, and senior advisor to Ferguson Partners and he has recently taken up various non-executive roles. He is well known in the industry, and we believe his leadership, experience, and commitment to RICS will bring great benefit to the institution, its staff, and the environment in which we are operating. Martin, can I invite you to say a few words, please? Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Clem. Um, I, I'd just like to say, really, I'm not going to say a great deal, but I'd just like to say I'm absolutely delighted and feel privileged uh, to be here and being chosen as the new uh, chair of the RICS. Um, I'm looking forward to working with all of the staff, all of the members, and all of the stakeholders uh, in trying to help ensure that the RICS works to become recognised for being the leading world-class institution that it really is. So there's a lot of work to do to achieve that, I think. Uh, there's a lot of committed people here um, that I'm going to be working with to help facilitate that. And I'm really looking forward to starting that journey at the beginning of the year. So I'm thrilled and delighted to be here and look forward to working with as many of the staff as I can going forward. So thank you, Clement. Thank you, Martin. I'm sure everyone joins me in congratulating you on your new appointment. It is the greatest possible honour for Charles Surveyor to serve as RICS president. This would hold true at any point in RICS over 150 years history. And this year, it has been my honour to do so. So let me begin by thanking every member for your dedication to professionalism. It has been my privilege to witness during my years as your profession, as your president. As previous speakers have set out throughout this meeting, this is a time of immense change for our profession and indeed the wider world. From the, world, from the war in Ukraine and the lasting effect of pandemic to the devastating impact of extreme weather from California to Karachi, reflecting on this year, it is hard to overstate the destabilization effects of the threats facing the communities and market around the world. Despite important progress in many areas, as seen most recently, 
in COP26 in Egypt, we still have a mountain to climb. Before we can credibly claim that the world is on a safe path to a secure, just and prosperous future for all its citizens. Nevertheless, one of the great privileges of my presidential year has been to witness the global scale and impact of RISS members as they help clients and communities grapple with these challenges of our age together. This has been the case from start to finish. From January at the WBF Dubai Summit, where I saw how members are leading in devising and delivering innovation to help create more livable urban space, as to recently, as last month, when I saw recognized at various RICS award ceremony around the world, the breadth of talent and professionalism in evidence at every level of our quick surveying community. Elsewhere, I heard inspiring story of resilience and saw at first hand how members are leading in nurturing our professional community through the flourishing series of member-led events taking place across the world. I saw the determination and ambition of candidates who were preparing and going through the rigor of, our, of APC, together with the dedication and generosity of our assessor community, together delivering and safeguarding the future of professionalism. And amongst everyone who contribute to the conversations and gatherings focused on DEI, I felt the passion for creating a more welcoming and diverse environment, all of which is driving positive action to create a profession where everyone can fight. This year was also one in which the profession, the UK and Commonwealth, and the world experienced great sadness at the loss of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, our late patron. I remain deeply conscious of the privilege it was to represent the thoughts and sentiment of the profession at this time. This was a truly remarkable person whose impact on the world, not least on our own institution, will continue to resonate throughout the years. As I said at the time of the state funeral, and in sending our thoughts to His Majesty the King. It is my hope that we continue to honour Her Majesty's example of exceptional devotion to duty in how our dedication as professionals to serving the public advantage in everything we do. Of course, the key opportunity and rallying call for all of us to do this and to ensure we are all supported to do so sustainably in the years ahead is in the implementation of the Bishop RICF review recommendations. The genesis of the review was a time of great anxiety for the profession and a feeling that something truly transformative was needed to live up to the promise of RICF's purpose to promote the usefulness of the profession to public advantage. I have been fortunate to have seen and played my part in the work of Governing Council and countless individual members to take forward at pace the recommendation in their letter and spirit. It requires the energy and application of members and RISS staff alike. And I'm proud and grateful everything every one of you has done so far to engage with this defining challenge. What we are implementing together is essential in all senses of that word. Essential for ensuring this great institution can support professionally, can, pro can support profession sustainably in their vital work and focus on the essence of what the institution must always be to face the future effectively. That is to say, member-led, with public interest at its heart. We have achieved much and I have been truly inspired by what you have done so far. Yet, much more remains to be done. However, I'm confident that your governing council who build on this substantial progress to deliver the institution we need and demand. In Anne Gray, who will assume the chair of governing council, 
and serve as president this coming year, you have a powerful advocate for the profession, who I know will champion your impact and ensure that every member gets the support they need from RICS to flourish. I wish her well and look forward to seeing the profession go from strength to strength under her leadership. One year ago, I spoke of the honour to standing before you as president of our great profession. I promise both personally and on behalf of Governing Council to work hard and pace in everything I did, to help rebuild trust and regain your faith as member in the institution. In closing, I share with you my fervent hope that I serve you well. My thanks for trust you place in me and my confidence that our great profession, steadfast in the commitment to the public advantage, has a bright future ahead. Thank you very much. I would now like to draw this meeting to a close. I hope you have enjoyed the RICS AGM. We would really like to receive your feedback. So if you have any comments to be made, please send them to the email address at ricsagm at rics.org. I would also like to invite everyone who has attended in person to join me for some light refreshment next door in the council chamber. Thank you for all coming. I wish you all the best in 2023. Thank you.